You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million on my head. I'm a better player than a robot. Just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil that shit ain't cheap, but it gets. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the fifth part of What If Naruto Joins Star Wars. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of Neon Zenjetsu on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. The lightning howled. Great arcs of blistering current coursed from one end of the hallway to another in swift succession, viciously electrocuting anyone or anything fool enough to cross in its path. And there were many, droid or genosian, it mattered not, all fell victim, be they flesh or metal. Force lightning was a deadly aspect of the force itself indeed and woe to the ones who thought to cross it. This was only made all the more baffling by the fact that the one wielding it wasn't a Sith, nor was he a Jedi, even. He despised the former, nor had any desire to return to the latter. He was simply gray. Sparks snarled from Count Dooku's hand as his saber sang, a deadly white curtain of light knocking away any bolt that came too close, dismembering whomever tried to close the distance. His body was as an extension of the Force, and by definition, his will. Though a storm of sound and fury raged around him he went untouched, moving like a wraith among his enemies. Always static, ever in motions. Metal buckled before him. Flesh rent and boiled within itself as he directed his wrath outward and made it manifest, slamming bolt after bolt into anyone or anything fool enough to stick its head out into the hall. It was something of a moving battle thus far. Every room was a fight, every corridor an army. Just how many numbers did they have? A distant whine snapped him back to reality and he spun just as a pair of droidekas unfurled itself behind him blasters at the ready. He knew these creations from what Jin had told him of them. They were deadly but only to the initiated or the unprepared. His hand made a tight fist, fingers clenching just as the spindly abominations attempted to raise their shields. With a roar, the force slammed down on them, crushing the skeletal creations into tight, twin balls of broken steel. The disaffected count held them there for a moment, lifted them up and sent them careening down the hall like a pinball, caroming wildly off the walls and their fellow droids to devastating effect. Satisfied with his work, the aging Jedi turned and found himself face to face with a super battle droid. Unlike their significantly more flimsy counterparts, these creations were more of a threat with their wrist-mounted blasters and rocket launchers. That blaster trained on him now and there was no more time for thought. Dooku gave himself to the force in its entirety deflecting a torrent of particle shots away from him and advancing on pure instinct. There was no light or dark here, only the force, trust in me, it said, and he did as he was bade, yielding to it without reservation. He was its instrument and did wholly as it bade, without thought for his body or the wounds he might sustain. Do or do not, as his old mentor would say, there is no try, and Dooku didn't try. He succeeded. Barreling forwards, he leaped and planted his feet on the super battle droid's face for a heartbeat, staggering at half of a step. That brief moment of confusion on the machine's part proved more than enough for him, his body giving a sharp twist driving his blade deep into the machine's thick chassis before dragging it down in a brutal crosscut. The droid shuddered once and went limp on his blade, its bulky body acting as an impromptu shield against further fire. In that instant a stray bolt grazed his leg and Dooku hissed. Times like these reminded him of his age, the old ache in his bones, the pain that plagued him even with the force to sustain him. Jedi or not, master or not, he was only human, mortal. No matter how much he gave himself to the force, he still had limits limits painfully imposed upon his aging body. He was but one, and the enemy was many. Had he been fighting alone, he would have fallen to them a long ago, even with his newfound skills. Thankfully, he was far from alone. Race and Shuriken. The faintest tingle in the air was Dooku's only warning of the incoming attack, forcing him to quickly leap backward and then aside as a condensed mass of chakra and air whizzed past. It registered in his peripherals as little more than a keening white sphere shaped like a gigantic throwing star, and it showed the enemy no mercy. It was, in a word, death. Blaster bolts and sonic blasts spattered harmlessly off the snarling vortex, unable to penetrate the flying missile as it streaked unerringly to its target. And then it was upon them, howling into the mass ranks of super battle droids and genosians. This close Dookie could see the sheer volume of the attack through the force itself, a massing of deadly needless that ripped both synthetic and organic apart at the cellular level, shredding them with single-minded determination and all the while building, building, building. 
until all else fell away, and the world shook. Deeper within the complex, Django looked up sharply at the sound. He'd gotten loose again. Of course he had. Pack your things, Boba. We're leaving. With Naruto and Dooku. Dooku coughed, gazing on the sheer destruction before him. It was all he could think to do. Where once there had been several battalions of battle droids and Genosians, there were now little more than smoke, torn flesh and broken bits of metal. The Genosians themselves had fared even more poorly than their synthetic counterparts, because unlike droids, the bugs could feel pain. The mere thought of it made the Count cringe. What it must have been like to be torn apart piece by piece, atom by atom until nothing remained that was oblivion, and he had no desire to visit it. The wind alone had knocked him into a wall. Had he been any closer he might have had a personal experience with the all-consuming attack. Well, damn. A rough voice coughed into the smog. Good thing I held back, there. If I'd gone full blast I might have brought the whole building down. I tend to forget how fragile everything is in this universe. Having gotten his second wind, the aging count mange the sigh. Your penchant for destruction hasn't changed, I see. The shinobi menace barked a laugh. Nope. Naruto stepped forward out of the dust and dirt then, driving a biscar plated boot down onto the shattered remains a stuttering droid, putting it out of its misery. Now that he'd recovered his precious mask and the rest of his much-vaunted gear, the Mandalore's face was utterly inscrutable behind his helm. That mirth only conveyed by the jovial tone carried in his words. Still, it drew a smile from him and he accepted the hand as it was offered, allowing the mercenary to help him to his feet. So, lightning, eh? Neat trick. Any chance you could teach me it? I shudder to think what you might do with that kind of power at your disposal. But I suppose, if you insist. Dooku sniffed, trying in vain to brush the dirt from his graying hair and tattered cloak. It was no use. Naruto's blast had brought part of the ceiling down and scattered the stuff everywhere. There would be no remedying any of it until he left Genosis far, far away. A task that seemed to be taking a great deal longer to complete than he would have liked. Later, he declared as the marching of machine feet reached them. They are coming. Just a second. Now's as good a time as any, I suppose. To his surprise, the shinobi menace briefly dropped to a knee and muttered solemnly under his breath. Rest easy, princess. Dooku's frown grew more pronounced. What are you doing? Honoring the fallen. The blonde muttered, standing stiffly and turning to regard the next wave rushing to meet them. Speaking of tricks how about this? Dooku paused, watching the Mandalorian shinobi take a stark step forward and bring both arms back. He felt the air shift around the man suddenly something that both was in was not the force rippling through the space between. Whatever it was, it had his eyes burning a ghastly shade of violet beneath his helm burning bright enough to be visible even behind the opaque visor. In the next instant, the blonde snarled and swung both arms forward, bringing his palms together in a resounding and thunderous clap. If Dooku was finesse, then the Mandalore was raw power, a blunt instrument that mowed down all in his path. There was a certain poetry about that, there. There was no poetry in the sheer column of destruction that followed. No rhyme or reason to any of it. As if a giant had chosen that moment to exhale, so too did the complex. Wind keened and shrieked, given life and form, unleashed upon the foolish and unwitting. The enemy host didn't even have time to fire their weapons before they were ripped from their hands as they, then their owners were torn apart. Guards ground into gory red stains against the puce colored walls and flung upwards to dash themselves against the ceiling. Ha! Huh. The Mandalore crowed, lowering his arms as the base shook anew. That'll get their attention. Dooku inclined his head in quiet acquiescence. A clever application of the force, indeed. Naruto laughed. It was a deep, throaty sound. Trust me, get creative enough and you get all kinds of ideas. Still chuckling, he drew his saber and plunged deeper into the complex. Meanwhile, peace came slowly to Anakin Skywalker. Caught adrift in the endless currents of the force, the young Jedi willed himself not to think, not to feel, only to be. In meditating he found his center, his peace, his focus. Here there were no thoughts to plague him no rationale by which he might undo himself no jealousy, no dark voices to natter away at him. There were no expectations here, no philandering father to measure up to, to overshadow him. A family where he felt distant and detached, alone in a sea of countless faces. There was none of that here, only a purity of emotion he'd never experienced before, a serenity he'd never known, yet wanted all along. Cleansing. Perhaps this whole patience thing wasn't such a foregone conclusion after all. This was soothing. And with peace came clarity. It was never hate he had felt for his father. He saw that now. He simply wanted to be his own person. His own man. He wanted others to be proud of him and his accomplishments. Not of his every deed compared to someone else. It had taken the disappearance of his father to make him see that. To truly see how petty his bias was. 
His struggle seemed so small now, so terribly inconsequential when compared to the feeling of being one with the Force. And so, just like that, he exhaled, and let go. He'd never meditated this deeply before, never had the time, never saw the purpose in it, never been this in tune with the Force. Impatience was always a constant companion, the anger and frustration that came with his misspent youth driving him toward the dark. But here, he felt none of that, not but the barest of anxieties. He couldn't truly eradicate temptation of course, no one could, but here, he didn't have to. Because he did not see the dark, for he was too distracted by the light, caught up in the in-between. Because Anakin saw, he saw everything. For a fleeting instant he saw it in its entirety, endless possibilities for himself and countless beings throughout the galaxy, some in which he lived, others in which he died. A future where he had a family of his own, a family with Padme. Their faces, blurry they were, indistinct, yet recognizable all the same and somehow he knew. He just knew that they were his children. They looked up at him and warmth blossomed in his chest, a pure heat that pushed all doubt away to make room for utter certainty. Yes, this was the future he wanted. The one Anakin latched onto that with all his might and allowed himself to be swept up in it. If he focused his will, he could hear their laughter, feel their joy. Ani, and with a single word, it was all ripped away. Brown eyes drifted open. Isla was waiting there for him when he opened his eyes. Sweet, gentle Isla, who he could never bring himself to be angry at for more than a few minutes at a time and sometimes, not even then. Here, rising from her seat, she gestured at the doors and they slammed shut behind him. The harsh bang of sound nearly startled the younger Force user badly. Even so, the Twi'lek didn't so much as bat an eyelash at his discomfort. If anything she seemed quietly bemused by his blatant anxiety. Sorry to keep you waiting. She apologized kindly. I was a bit tied down with the Ahsoka. It's okay. It gave me time to think. The ex-Jedi didn't ask him about what. She had no idea how intensely grateful he was for that. Instead, she asked him a different question. How does it feel to see Jedi again? Strange. The apprentice confessed. I might have been one if not four. If not for Naruto. Ayla finished quietly. Yes. Ah, uh, Sith spit. She muttered. I'm really no good with this. Anakin stood with a slow grunt, wincing as his legs protested the sudden movement after so long, shooting pins and needles down his calves. With the Konoha in hyperspace there was little else to do but think, and now he found himself oddly longing for the solace of the Force once more. He'd learned seen so much merely by listening to the Force. It was intoxicating, but this was neither the time nor the place. He was the one who'd demanded this meeting of her, who'd badgered her with questions until she finally gave in. Look, he began awkwardly, unable to meet her piercing eyes, I wanted to. Sit, the Twi'lek said, by way of continuing their conversation. Anakin reluctantly did as he was bade. I see you finally took your father's advice, she said, no doubt referring to his meditation. The chosen one managed a nod. Now, I'm not your mother, she said plainly, and I never will be. I don't expect you to treat me like SHMI. But if we're going to get along, if we're going to be a family, you need to tell me what's bothering you. Ask me a question if you have one. Come to me if you're feeling angry about something I did or didn't do. A few hours ago, Anakin would have exploded with questions. Now, he felt only relief at her words. I do have one question. He confessed. Ask. Aya replied. Now my father. He corrected himself ruthlessly. Why do you love him? Those warm, brown eyes softened. Let me tell you a story. They should not have made this bargain. Newt Gunray knew it. Felt it in the very core of his being as he flung himself down the hall. His legs caught against his long robe and he went down with an undignified yelp, tangled up in his escort. When his droids tried to lift him up he slapped their cold, unfeeling hands away, shrieking. Damn them. Damn him. It was all coming apart at the seams. Let the rest of the separatists stay. He knew better. They thought their grand rebellion so close, so profitable. But little did they realize it was destined to die a stillbirth. Sith or no, there was no stopping that man. He was an army unto himself, unstoppable, vicious, insatiable, the shinobi menace. He heard him in every sound, now saw him in each shadow as he ran headlong for the ship. He was there, lurking in every corner, haunting every waking instant, plaguing his every thought like a wild virus, tainting all that he touched. Not a moment went by when he didn't think of his impending demise just as he'd done since that awful day ten years ago. The Trade Federation had been decimated back then. But by some miracle he had managed to escape the Republic justice thanks to his powerful friends in the Senate. He'd nearly died back then. Indeed, many still thought him dead to this day as a result of that careful deception. He wasn't so foolish to believe he would survive now, should he linger here. They just had to make it to the ship. A few others, Rune Hako and Watt Tambor had opted to flee with him. The rest had chosen to stay. 
Oh, they thought themselves safe thanks to their benefactor and his so-called apprentice. Gunray knew better. Where had the Sith been during the Battle of Naboo? Nowhere. Where had the Sith been when the Shinobi menace had come for him? Nowhere. His apprentice had been annihilated or so he had heard to the extent of his knowledge and Sidious himself had never materialized. Now he learned that the man had been none other than Chancellor Palpatine all along, and said Chancellor was viciously slain at the hands of the very same man, and they thought these new Sith could protect them. More fools, they. He frantically palmed at the nearest keypad, hurriedly inputting the sequence he knew would open the door to the hangar where his ship awaited. Clunk, the door chose that very moment to jam opening a crack, no more before stalling and falling short. Gunray nearly wept in dismay, clawing at it. Why did the universe conspire against him so? Despite his best efforts to pry it apart, the Durasteel stubbornly resisted his efforts. When he bade his droids open fire, their shots simply ricocheted off the durable blast material. What fresh hell was this? Frantic, he ordered them to open it. But even those superior synthetics proved unable to budge the frozen frame more than a few inches. Just enough to stick his hand through. Nothing more. Behind them, Watt Tamber finally lost his resolve and bolted. I'm getting out of here. Gunray barely spared him a glance. No, you fool. Not that way. Alas, the engineer did not heed his words. Hako quavered beside him. We should not have made this bargain. Gunray struck his assistant full on in the face, made furious by the man's cowardice, as well as his own. Silence, you fool. Think you I know not this. From the opposite end of the corridor, Tambra shrieked, a shrill, blood-curdling cry that had both Nemoidians cringing. No, please. I only wanted peace. I swear to you. I. An agonizing crunch cut his cries short. A dreadful pall fell over them all. Then came the blackness. Light suddenly died in the hall, extinguished by some unseen hand. The ceiling lights shattered and sputtered out one by one, plunging the room into blackness. Gunray cringed, hiding his head as shards of glass struck his body, struggling not to cry out lest he be heard by their assailant. Hako wasn't so wise, and his loud, shrill scream bespoke exactly how he felt, and secretly the Viceroy's own emotions as well. Their useless droids did nothing to stop nor prevent this, staring in quiet confusion as the last of the glow panels died with a keening pop. No, he knew this sound. He'd heard it somewhere before. In the soundless rush of the void, the Viceroy heard a sound. A deep, rending wrench of broken metal as someone or something. Ripped the door open at the end of the hall. A wordless whimper fled from his mouth, an unimmissable sound of pure terror, a raw, animal bleat that betrayed his base nature. Gunray had always been a coward, even in his younger years as a jube. Easily beaten, easily deceived, easily cowed by those stronger than him. Those years flashed before his eyes in a blink as harsh, heavy bootfalls reached his ears. Then in the darkness came a sound. Deep, heavy, breathing. In the blackness parted. Thesezm. A lone blade the cruel color of darkest crimson sprang into existence, bathing the pitch-black room in sinister shades of scarlet. Red? Why was his blade red? Gunray didn't have an answer and didn't think to care. It only terrified him all the more. His already broken mind found itself driven to the very depths of despair by this fresh hell. The man's armor seemed darker somehow than he remembered, the shadows clinging to his cape, his dark, featureless mask reflecting no emotion. There was no mercy to be had there in the reaper's visage, only pure wrath. No witty remarks here, no clever quips, only death. For a terrifying moment there was only silence. Then Gunray shrieked, open fire. Fortunately, all his droids and all his men did as they were bade. Unfortunately for them, they were, to a man, hopelessly outmatched. The armored man raised his blade and effortlessly parried that first salvo as effortlessly as one would fend of a child throwing rocks, easily batting the volley of bolts aside and ricocheting streaks of red light cascading back to their owners. Then he started forward, slowly at first, then with determination, striding into the storm with swift measured steps. Though the droids fired with precision, he batted each shot back to them, and even caught others in his open hand to redirect them back from whence they came. Through sheer will, he reached out and ripped those weapons from their very hands, sending them skittering out into the hall, and out of their reach, dismembering them when a number foolishly tried to attack him head on. Seeing this, Gunray renewed his attempts to open the door, clawing at it madly. Open, damn you. Open, droid echoes clumsily unfurled themselves, made clumsy by the confined spaces. These he crushed with his mind alone rending them apart through their shields and hurling them into their fellows. His hand clenched into a claw, crushing the throat of a nearby Nemoidian commando and hurling him away into the wall. His comrade frantically raised a flamethrower, only for the weapon's volatile fuel tank to ignite, consuming him in a vile, roiling blaze of orange and sending him shrieking into a wall. 
The third levered his staff in a desperate attempt to catch the Dark Lord off guard, only to find himself embedded upon that very weapon and skewered to the floor. Gunray squealed and pulled ever harder on the broken door, turning his pale fingers a disgusting shade of puce. No, not like this. This cannot be my end. A trio super battle droids raised their arms and promptly found themselves divested of them. Their large, bulky bodies shattered with a single blow to the chest. The Dark Lord for he could no longer think of this merely as the shinobi menace was already moving by the time their broken carapaces crashed to the floor. In the same movement, a savage flick of the wrist slammed Rune Hako into the ceiling, pinning him there as though he were magnetized. Mandalore struck out almost casually as he passed, bisecting the terrified Nemoidian at the waist. His severed halves toppled to the ground behind him with no more than a gurgle. Open, 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 open. The deep, rasping breathing was upon him now and with that, Gunray abruptly realized he no longer had any soldiers left to command. No droids left to die in his service. An invisible vice tightened around his throat not a heartbeat later, hoisting him up off the floor, denying him all attempts of escape. Who was this creature? This wasn't the Shinobi menace. This wasn't a man, no, not at all. This was a monster. W who are you? To his terror, the specter leaned forward, black lenses burning a hellish red, and declared in a roaring voice, I am your father. Shock took over, the terrified Nemoidian went limp and collapsed, eyes rolling back in his head. Perhaps, had he held on to his consciousness for another second more, Newt Gunray would have realized just how spectacularly he'd been had. Alas, he did not, and as such when the Darth dropped him, he did not see the carefully crafted illusion crumble around him. He did not see the lights flicker on, did not see the red lightsaber fade to a gentle azure blue, and he most certainly did hear the Dark Lord begin to laugh. It was not a cackle, or even a demented shriek, but the simple, pleasant laugh of an amused man. Huh, oh, you should have seen the look on your face. Priceless, I need to use this sh tick more often. A bit dramatic, don't you think? You could have simply killed him and been done with it. Slowly, the monstrosity turned, its helmeted head reflecting stoic silence in the wake of Dooku's rebuke. Darth Vader chuckled hoarsely and turned to smoke, revealing a smirking Naruto beneath. Well, it did serve a purpose. The shinobi menace beamed, dusting a bit of smoke off from himself with a half-hearted shrug. I conjured up the most terrifying thing I'd seen in my visions and disguised myself as him. Put the fear right into them, and made them think there's something even more terrifying than me. Further, we now have someone to interrogate in any even, and once he wakes up, he'll be sure to tell each of his dear, dear friends all about the Dark Lord who nearly killed him. The rest will think twice before trying to start a war, and in the event that they're still stupid enough to go through with it, well plausible deniability. Duku arched a grey brow. Careful you don't stray into the darkness yourself, menace. Naruto scoffed, idly watching a disguised clone carrying the insensate Nemoidian off. Take him to a shuttle and make sure he survives. The doppelganger saluted smartly and set off to its task. Now then, grinning, he donned the mask of Mandalore once more and turned back towards the catacombs. Let's go hunting. But why hunt when I've already found you? A dark voice intruded. Naruto drew up short as the door. That infernal, jammed door gunray had been flailing it. Suddenly snapped open with a rush of hot air. That wouldn't have been a cause for concern by itself, but the pure rush of sheer dark side energy that followed, that, however, was. A slender figure awaited them behind it, flinging back a dark hood as he looked on. Oh, dear. Her silken voice oozed like so much poisoned honey. I hope I'm not interrupting your little celebration. Naruto took a moment to take her in behind his helmet. She was beautiful certainly in her dark robes, but in a cruel, severe way. Skin the color of the palest snow, eyes like cruel angry slits. Yellow slits, Naruto realized with a start, staring into those peerless amber orbs. All at once he found himself reminded of Maul. All his fears and shortcomings realized in an instant. His smile vanished, replaced by an irritated scowl, all thoughts of play and pretense stripped away. So, the Sith were not as extinct as he'd begun to believe. Well, that was unfortunate. He'd have to fix that. Another one. You've got to be fucking kidding me. Who the hell are you? I am a Sag Ventress. The Night Sister introduced herself with a demure bow. My master brings you greetings from the beyond. He offers you a choice, Count. Dooku arched an elegant brow. Oh, what might that be? Red blades blaze to life. Join us or die. A lifetime ago, Dooku might have wavered. In another time, another age, he might have been tempted, even. He'd always had anger, always been disaffected with the Republic since his earliest days as a Jedi. The chance to tear it down and start again. To make it better than ever before who wouldn't leap at such a chance. But now, he saw no argument in joining the dark side. 
In the short time since he'd left the Jedi Order on his own terms he'd already done so much good, more than he'd ever hoped to. Was he really willing to throw all that away now? No. His decision was made, rather, it had been made long ago. With a flourish, he ignited his lightsaber. I'm afraid I must refuse. Golden eyes narrowed. Pity. The attack came lightning fast. Ventress was in her prime and full of dark fury towards the Jedi, while Dooku was old and nowhere near his peak. Had he been a heartbeat slower he would have lost his head. As it were, he wasn't alone, and Naruto was there, flinging himself into her path before her twin blades could complete their devastating arc. Counteroffer. He snarled against their crossed sabers. You tell me who the hell your master is and I kill you quickly. Sorry, I'll have to decline. Good. Then he flew at her and their world exploded into light. Found him. With that simple declaration, everything descended into chaos, sheer pandemonium in its most primal of forms. A cacophony of shouts answered Ayla's decree almost immediately, nearly drowning out her response. In the madness that followed Celeste found she had to physically take a step back merely to make sense of it all. Even then she struggled to rein her senses in against the tide of emotion that followed. With nearly the entire crew present aboard the Konoha in addition to a certain senator alongside her resident Jedi protector, and his Padawan besides the resultant flood threatened to floor the former shadow where she stood. It was, in a word, exasperating. And yet she was oh so fond of it all the same. She wouldn't trade any of this beautiful chaos for the galaxy. Joy, shock, surprise, confusion, but also relief in something else, something she daren't give voice to. As through driven by a great cleansing wave the tension of the last few hours all but evaporated, washed away by the sea of bodies that surged towards the cockpit. Blasted Wookiee would have flattened her if she hadn't flung herself against the wall at the last moment. For her part SHMI didn't rush after the rest of the crew, sparing her an indulgent smile. She stoically shepherded her girls after an exuberant HK-47. That would have been all well and good if the latter had decided to start singing their praises. Rejoice, meatbags. The droid's tinny voice echoed on ahead, momentarily grating against her nerves. She had the sneaking suspicion the old unit might well be prancing with every step. The master has been found. Oh, happy day. Once more I can maim and murder to my heart's content. Sparky trilled something that sounded dangerously like an invective. Hush you bucket of bolts, lest you be my next victim. An electronic raspberry told her what their resident astromich thought of that remark and the pair dissolved back into bickering. For a fleeting instant, Celeste honestly considered tripping the assassin up, if only to see what would happen. Perhaps even subjecting the mouthy mechanical to a healthy jolt and blaming it on said droid. What awaited her round the bend made her think better of it, always attentive to every facet of the ship and those inhabiting its many nooks and crannies. The ancient Jedi easily detected or rather, caught Anakin and Padme drifting out of a nearby alcove as she turned the next corner. Indeed, the pair suspiciously slunk several steps behind the others, almost conspicuously so. There was a spark in the elder Skywalker's eyes that hadn't been there before, a spring to his step she'd failed notice, slightly less noticeable in young Admidala, but the signs were there if one knew what to look for. And while she might still be a novice in such matters herself, Celeste Morn was no fool. Well, now, had it been anyone else Celeste would have simply dismissed what she saw and put the scene from her mind altogether, outright ignored their close proximity to one another. But not these two. She saw it there, the way in which their shoulders brushed, heard it in their hushed voices, felt it in the strange, almost familiar euphoria radiating from. A dark brow rose in realization. When had they found the time for that? Something of her surprise must have shown in her expression or leaked through the force for Anakin's gaze found hers. Comprehension dawned and a rare muscle jumped in the teen's jaw. Despite her best efforts, Celeste felt a sly smile crept across her face. Really, she couldn't help but tease them. Annie was like a kid brother to her after all these years. The idea of letting such a prize opportunity slip by uncontested went again the very core of her beliefs and if she had a little fun while she was at it more the better. Just where were you hiding, hum? A slew of sputtering followed. That's what? Speak up. The ex-Jedi's grin grew another inch as she raised a hand to frame her right ear. I can't seem to hear you. Given her close proximity to the unlikely pair Celeste beheld the exact moment when Anakin's tan visage flushed with equal parts relief and pride. Surprisingly he held his ground in the face of her taunt. Not so at Midala. Before her expectant gaze Padma's face turned a delightful shade of pink and a tiny squeak fled from her lips. She was going to bluff, of course. Her response proved almost painfully predictable. You've been tasked with protecting me, nothing more. She huffed, a rare blush rising to her cheeks. What I do with my time is no business of yours. Well that's just precious. The laugh leaped from Celeste's lips before she could think to hold it back. 
So, when's the wedding? Are we invited? Bingo. In the end, they lasted a combined 10 seconds before Padme broke ranks and bolted, dragging Anakin by the hand with her. Good. Seemed Ayla had done right by taking young Skywalker aside to speak with him after all. At the very least, she'd spurred him to act and in doing so turned his attentions elsewhere. All things considered, it was a welcome change from the stress they'd all been subjected to as of late, an aspect she took a moment to bask in. But only a moment, then she reluctantly spurred herself on after the happy couple to ascertain the situation. How did you manage to track him? Obi Wan was inquiring as she slid into the cockpit behind the rest. Homing beacon, probably. SHMI offered a small, sardonic smile. He's surprisingly paranoid. Speaking of paranoid, does anyone else sense that? Qui-Gon adopted a grimace. I'm afraid so. Isla's head popped up over the seat, her leku all but vibrating with tension. It was an emotion Celeste recognized all too well. Leaning over the Twi'lek, she stole a glance at the console. The information there sent a chill of nameless dread shooting down her spine, trailing icy fingers as it went. Not one of memory for she certainly didn't recognize the planet in question, but rather one of fear. Moments ago the Shinobi had been all but gone from the Force, now that once dense presence lay exposed by a riot of emotion. Sadness, sorrow, confusion, and there, looming above it all, hate. Something had gone terribly, horribly wrong and she knew not what. Her eyes narrowed to dangerous golden slits. What is he doing on Genosis? Isla stifled a small sigh. Dead man walking. Whatever retort she might have flung back at her died on her tongue as the Kanoha lurched violently around them. The floor heaved, casting some to the floor, others clinging to the walls and chairs for dear life. As one, every light dimmed. Moments later the vessel's engine died a harsh, rattling death as it strained against whatever had caught them. Celeste inhaled sharply, suddenly aware of the telltale scent of smoke. Too late, the force shrilled a warning and the world shook again, eliciting several sharp shouts from those present. Distantly, she heard their voices as the vessel rattled anew. Shields are down. Did you check the sensors? What in the blue hell was that? Anakin barked. Did we hit something? I don't know. Oila snapped back. Something's caught us. Controls are unresponsive. There's nothing on the damned sensor. Someone retorted. We've got no power. Everything's locked out. Something shrieked across the viewport in the form of an ugly mottled blur, gone before Celeste could properly register it. The harsh scream of an vessel's engine above served as their only warning. Not a heartbeat later their world erupted into the blue fire of an ion cannon. Genosis. They couldn't kill her. Naruto sensed the battle turning long before it became apparent to Dooku. Bounding over an upturned piece of machinery ripped Fee from its moorings. He struck down at where he knew Ventress to be. Only to find himself tumbling back in a smoking heap as a fresh volley of dark lightning caught him headlong in the chest. Every fiber of his being body howled in untold agony as flesh cauterized and healed in the same instant, in the time that it took for his synapses to register the pain he'd caught himself on a nearby vat hanging over the abyss. For a wild, fleeting instant the world pivoted beneath him and he nearly lost his gorge. Irk, heights. He swallowed. I forgot how much I hated these damn heights. It was the ninth time the enemy had predicted him thus. Coincidence or not, this bordered on the absurd. Just what the hell was happening here? Beats me. On your left. The telltale beating of insectile wings coupled with Kirama's harsh warning drew him back to the present and he hauled himself upright just as the Genosian fell upon him. With a supreme effort the ninja reached out and forced the fingers of his left hand into a claw, crushing the spindly creature into an unrecognizable mass before it could bring its weapon to bear. Its twin found itself bisected by the blazing blue blade of his lightsaber before it too found itself compacted to a dense mass by the blonde's will. A fresh thought slammed the ruined corpse forward like a cannonball against a new wave of spindly droid echoes, sending the curved creations shrieking away to shatter harmlessly against one another. And for one blessed moment, he caught his breath, sparing the ruined droids little more than a passing glance as they plummeted to the assembly line below. Naruto gathered his legs beneath him and searched for the signs of his enemy. Around him the world thrummed with the sounds of industry, fresh droids being assembled and disassembled as he looked on. Under any other circumstance he might have admired the sight if not for the ramifications. There were hundreds thousands if not more. This went well beyond his expectations. It could only mean the separatists were well and truly preparing for war despite his best efforts. As if someone were spurring them on, manipulating them. They had to destroy this place. But not here. Not now. Doing so now would bring everything down around their ears, likely killing him and Dooku both. Speaking of which, where ah? Ventress's low cackle captured his attention as he caught the signature flicker of a silver blur arcing against red. The Count fought well, but even from here one could see that he was tiring. 
For all his skill he fought against one far younger and more able of body. There you are. A single leap carried him back to the battle just as Dooku renewed his assault against the Sith. Wide eyes glittered back at him with ruthless glee, brimming with madness. Two fingers flicked forward over the hilt of her leftmost saber but this time he was prepared, shouldering through. He'd already lost one blade to that very trick, and in the chaos, he hadn't been able to find it again. She knew where to strike, how to harm him, find the weak points in his armor to attack the vulnerable seams. Sometimes it seemed as though she could impossibly cut through them to strike at the vulnerable flesh beneath. The thought brought with it a fresh pang of anger and lent his limbs a burst of strength. Still, she laughed at him, getting tired, old man. The taunt rose, jarring his concentration. Perhaps you'd fight better if I went after your doting wife. A muscle jumped in his jaw. For every strike that they gained on her, their enemy fought back with renewed ferocity, burgeoned by seemingly limitless vitality, fresh as a daisy. Her sabers were a whirlwind of red light, intercepting every stroke of his blade, every shot, every assault. Within moments they fell back into a familiar rhythm, a pattern from which neither could break free. Yet again again, the duo found themselves at a stalemate. Whenever he or the aging count struck at the pale woman, be it through blade or force, they found themselves unable to strike her down. Not through lack of effort by any means, whenever their blows came close to home, something or someone would turn their blades away at the last moment. Whenever they combined their efforts and cornered her, she managed to slither away with her spiteful laughter. Time and time again the night sister eluded them, leading them deeper into the complex. By now she'd drawn them into the very heart of the droid factory itself, an environment replete with hazards of its own. Though they fought on, the tide of droids and Genosians seemed endless. And still, no sign of Django. That had been hours ago, or perhaps it was days. He no longer knew. Time had long since blurred from the beginning of their battle to this moment, and as with all things, fatigue had begun to set in. Now the mere act of blocking threatened to render his arms numb. When he resorted to his more destructive techniques the nimble Sith easily evaded. Others were negated altogether, as if she knew his every thought, could predict every move before he made it. It infuriated him. That anger only fueled his blows, held firmly in check by leash of his sanity. The latter was beginning to fray with each passing moment as exasperation chipped at the wall of his resolve. He just didn't have it. Had it been the two of them alone, with no risk of collateral damage, with no one to protect, with no distractions he was sure it would have been easy. But this this, snarling a curse, he thrust his saber between her and Dooku, parrying what would have otherwise been a fatal stroke at the older man's chest. For his part, the aging count reposted and drove Ventress back with a torrent of his own, to his initial surprise. The ensuing onslaught of bolts staggered her and forced the younger warrior back half a step. Naruto saw the opening and lunged, striking forward with a brutal crosscut intended to finally take her laughing head from her shoulders. When he struck high she went low, fainting at his knees before sweeping past, hard and fast. Too late he realized her intent. In a flash of crimson, she pounced and found Dooku's back. In a whirl of silver the count spun, evading the fatal blow, but only just. One of her blades still pierced his side, emerging with a hiss of cauterized flesh. Grunting in surprise, the aging count sank to a knee, raising his blade in a desperate attempt to fend off what would no doubt be the killing stroke screaming down at his head. And Naruto moved, just as she'd expected him to. Be it by speed or luck or perhaps she'd intended it all along he flung himself between her, and that fatal blow even as he struck out with one of his own. Rather than resist the nimble night sister bent with the force of his strike crossing her sabers, she used his own weight against him, sending the his saber oil as saber, skittering out of his grasp. Even as he reached out with it through the force he knew he wouldn't be fast enough. A triumphant shout tore out of her. Confident in her victory, she threw one last jibe at him. Oh, don't fret. Ventress cooed. Your family will join you soon enough. When she struck down at him, the shinobi didn't dodge. Wild eyes blazed up at her. No. Loved hands shot up, caging her wrists in an unassailable grasp. The crimson light of her sabers masked his face, casting his whiskered visage in vicious crimson relief. Something hardened in those azure eyes of his, a great and terrible hate coalescing into existence before her very eyes. As she looked on he rose from his knees like a puppet severed from its strings, woodenly and without care. Pain flared in her limbs as palms sheathed in steel clamped down upon pliable flesh. Try as she might, for all her power, she found herself helpless to resist the sheer physical strength of her captor. Her right wrist gave with a terrible crunch then, sending the saber there tumbling from her grasp. Rather than clatter to the floor the blade's fall found itself arrested at the last moment by the force itself. Too late she realized her peril, but trapped as she was, the night sister found herself powerless to do anything about it. 
A crushing force push flung her off the high ground and down to one of the lower levels back, her heels digging great furrows against the metal. Aghast, she raised her gaze toward the ramp, reaching, straining for her saber dot 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 only to find the blade unresponsive. It hung there rooted for a long, tenuous moment, awaiting its new master. A snake of dread coiled in her chest as an armored arm rose, reaching for the still active weapon. Silence stretched between them, broken only by the sounds of relentless machinery. And like a machine, he moved. Firm fingers wrapped around its sinister curved hilt, raised it up and aloft, the crimson hotly intent. Vicious golden eyes leered down at her. With a roar he flew at her. The first strike slammed down against Ventress's guard with such force that the witch nearly found herself driven to her knees. Now came the second, barreling through her defenses, forcing her to clutch at the hilt with both hands lest she be overwhelmed entirely, as the third hammered home into her weapon, splintering the floor beneath her feet. Still he struck down, hammering blow after blow against her defenses, snarling, shouting at her, cursing her very existence until something inevitably as all things must finally gave, and the last brick in the wall of her defenses crumbled, taking the ground with it. Still he didn't relent, cutting down at her head. Red flooded her vision. Django Fett. Everything was wrong. Wrong, wrong, terribly horribly wrong. It should have been a simple job for Django, by all rights it had been until an hour ago. Abduct an old ally on Coruscant, take him prisoner, and allow his new employer to have their way with him. Nothing more, nothing less. Naruto was many things, but he was also soft easy to trust, too quick to lend a helping hand to anyone who might be in need. Django knew that weakness well. He'd ruthlessly abused it to get the drop on him, to keep him contained, until quite suddenly he wasn't. Now the menace was coming for him. Django heard it in the way the walls shook around him, knew it by the dying screams of the Genosians behind them as they died in the dozens, hundreds, then thousands. Such horrible sounds, living beings shouldn't be able to scream like that. Naruto didn't care about any of them. Didn't care about the bugs or their droids, or the ally he'd left behind. He had one victim, one target, one goal, him. But he didn't matter. Boba did. He had to get his son to safety, no matter the cost. Dad. Small arms tightened fist clutched at his sleeve as he slammed down another corridor. I'm scared. Django wasn't afraid, he was utterly terrified. If he'd known this would have happened he never would have taken the job. Consequences be damned. An awful crunch resounded somewhere in the hangar behind him and for a moment the old mercenary felt everything shake. Even clad in full armor as he was, the mercenary fought down a silent shudder. It felt like a giant fist had closed around everything, buckling the walls and ceiling alike. Boba whimpered into his shoulder. Django kept running. If they could just make it to Slave I then they would be home free dot 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 for a time. The galaxy was a big place. Surely there was somewhere to hide. Why are you running, Django? His former pupil howled after him as another blast door closed in their wake. I thought you were smarter than this. Against his better judgment he risked a backward glance across his shoulder. A blaster bolt raked across his heel and he glimpsed the visor of a helm not unlike his own mere moments before the Dursa steel slammed in the face of his pursuer. They both knew it wouldn't stop him. Not for long. It was already beginning to buckle and twist as the blonde beat it with his fists. Damn him. He was beginning to see why half of Mandalore obeyed this man. I thought you'd be dead by now. He growled as he resumed his flight. Why won't you die? The muffled roar that followed only made Django run all the harder. Blast this criffing job. The credits hadn't swayed him. Now, the threat of what would happen if he refused. That had. He was in too deep now to ever get out. His employer owned him. Body and soul. Any attempt on his part to rat them out would put Boba in peril. Peril he wasn't prepared to face. Django did no far the corporate guilds or the techno union. No, he feared the man who backed them. More than he feared this monster hunting them down or so he tried to tell himself. Dad, jump. Django obeyed without thought. A blazing red saber swept Pat where his legs had been not a moment before to carry him harmlessly off a wall. He fled before its owner could use the force to fling it after him again, stumbling through a second door as a fresh wave of droids and Genosians moved to intercept the berserker. He wasn't trying to kill them. Every attack until this very moment had been aimed to maim. Cripple, capture, he wanted to take them alive. Good he could use that. When the next door crashed open, he was ready. He glimpsed his former student in the corridor for the merest of moments before he moved. Armored fingers flexed and a panel pried itself loose to form a makeshift wall between him and the blast bolts. Another twitch of his fingers ripped a second panel free, then a third, fourth, fifth, more and more steel standing between him and the oncoming tide as he advanced. All the while, the mask of Mandalore gazed impassively back at him. 
When had he managed to get that back from his captors? Blast it. Where are they? Naruto's voice howled over the blaster fire. Tell me and all this stops. No one answered him and so the shinobi menace roared. Roared. All those armored plates shot forward in a blistering wave of molten metal. Behind it golden light burst from his entire body, turning his impromptu shields into whirring discusses of death. He needed them alive, not the droids, not the bugs, no one else. He had to hold back, preventing himself from bringing the entire complex down on their heads. Django saw his moment and took it. Sweeping his son tightly into his arms the Mandalorian tightened his shoulders and ducked, causing the upgraded missile in his jetpack to roar to life. Naruto saw it, his helmet snapping towards him. Behind it, he swore he saw golden eyes narrow. Rather than retreat he all but scoffed and waved his right hand in a lazy arc. Just like that the missile it sailed right back at them like an angry boomerang. Django jumped, jetpack flaring as he retreated. Even then, the explosion scorched his boots and seared the air in his lungs. Not so the missile. A dozen different thoughts raced through Django's head like treacherous rats as another door slammed behind him. This one crumpled far faster than the last. His family. Damn it all. Those stupid fools had really done it, hadn't they? He hadn't wanted to believe it at the time. Was that why his employer wanted to send him to Umbara? It must be. If his family was there if Naruto found them if he realized who was responsible well. Heads would roll. You didn't mess with a man's family. It just wasn't done. No wonder the kid snapped. The horrible screech of another sundered droid echo world passed him, its corpse propelled by an explosion. Right? Run faster. It wasn't so much that Django wanted to run, but rather, he no longer had a choice in the matter. Naruto was well and truly after him now no. Not Naruto. This abomination man wore his face, walked like him, talked like him, but it wasn't him. He'd seen those horrible golden eyes burning in the hall. Even if it was him he had no desire to face him head on. He didn't have a choice. Didn't the kid see that? Then again, he probably couldn't see much of anything now, other than the color red. An invisible fist crumpled the space he'd just occupied and ruptured the floor. Django, point taken. Django Fett fled, through shadow and flame, through smoke and ruin, until finally, he found their hangar. Slave I awaited them beyond, its hull gleaming silver and blue despite the dust raining down from the ceiling. Even then the deadly vessel stood fast against the arid air of Genosis, quiet and pristine, just waiting to be launched, utterly unaware of the horror descending upon it. There wasn't enough time. Damned it. Never enough time. He slipped a pair of mobile mines from his belt and slapped them against the main door, hoping against hope that they would be enough. Another explosion rattled the world behind them. Django stepped back, dropped his son to the floor, and thrust him forward. Get in the ship, Boba. The boy's face turned anguished and he tried to squirm free. But dad, Django rounded on him. Get in the bloody ship. Boba got. The elder Fett took the merest of moments to watch his son clamber up the ramp and slam into the cockpit beyond. In that moment, Django found himself glad for his helmet. His son hadn't been able to see the fear in his eyes. He never would. With a sputtering whine, the ship's engines flickered to life and didn't move. Slave I shuddered in place, as though held by an invisible fist, and it was with a pang of dread that Django realized why his son hadn't been able to escape, with or without him. Slowly, agonizingly, he turned and drew his blasters. So that's how it was. It had to be him, then. Someone else might have. With a hot rush of boiling steam, the door crashed open before him and the mines detonated. A startled grunt greeted him. Got you. Django opened fire into the smoke, knowing he was shooting blindly, knowing he had no other choice. His flamethrower barked explosively, spewing napalm at the hunched silhouette in the smoke. And the crumbling remains of super battle droid buckled beneath the bolts. Nothing more. Where? A soundless shadow detached itself from the ceiling and alighted behind the mercenary. No. Not quite soundless. The faintest rustle of cloth betrayed him. Too late, Django felt the hand clamp down on his shoulder. Too late did realize what was about to transpire. Too late, he tried to turn around. Said hand all but crunched down on his collarbone, rendering his right arm useless. You seem to have forgotten something. A harsh, angry voice hissed over his roar of pain. Before I was your student, I was a shinobi. Now clench your teeth. Then he struck him hard enough to make his helmet ring. He'd had him dead to rights. A single shot in the back or a swing of his saber would have been enough to end it. But the fool wanted to take him alive. Interrogate him. Why else would he bother to slug him in the head and fling him over his shoulder like a bag of wheat? Django should have been able to use that weakness. Turn it to his advantage. He was too busy writhing in pain. Breath burst from Django's lungs in an explosive gasp as his spine struck the floor. But not for long. By the time he scissored his legs and bolted upright, Naruto was on him again in a whirl of gold. 
a boot cannon into his chest before he could even think to try and fly away, denting the older man's armor and slamming him against Slave Eye like an angry rancor. The entire ship gave a ponderous groan as its metal hull buckled and warped beneath his back. He felt rather than saw his jetpack shudder against his shoulders. Blast it. There went the aerial option. Get up. A low snarl dragged him back to reality. I'm not done with you yet. Slowly, painstakingly, his old friend stalked forward. He'd lost his helmet somewhere in the blast, or perhaps he'd simply removed it. Regardless, it didn't change what who he was looking at. Vicious eyes of venomous gold blazed back at him, wide and pulsing with apoplectic fury. You just couldn't stop, could you? The words were a snarl as he advanced, cracking his knuckles. You had to keep pushing. You wanted to see me break. Congratulations. You succeeded. His entire being seemed to pulse with golden light before he got himself back under control. And now you have my attention. My anger. My hate. I hope it's everything you wanted, because you're about to suffer for it. It wasn't supposed to be this way, kid. The words tasted bitter in his mouth. Tell that to my family. Django drew and found the blaster ripped from his hand in the same moment. I'll admit, you got the drop on me last time. Naruto continued, idly turning the pistol end over end in his hand. His gauntlet tightened and ground the pistol into a shattered mast of metal, one he cast over his shoulder without so much as a backward glance. I'm not perfect by any measure. I let my guard down on Coruscant and you took full advantage. Abruptly, those golden orbs narrowed to poisonous slits upon him. Not this time, old friend. Either you come with me willingly and tell me what I need to know, or I beat your smug ass into the ground and drag you back to Mandalore in chains. Your choice. For a moment, Django almost considered his offer. Perhaps they could work together. Perhaps no. Something hardened in him. Bite me. He spat. Naruto blew out a sigh. Unfortunate. Escape was no longer an option, leaving him no choice but to stand his ground. Worse still, Boba was behind him, prepping the ship. In his fevered rage, he wouldn't put it past him to go after him. His arm snapped up in a fit of peak and flame burst from his wrist, ready to roast the blonde where he stood. Then the world flipped itself on its axis all over again. Django tried to rise but a torrent of angry lightning leaped from the man's fingers and struck him head on. Every muscle in his body clamped down like a live wire, forcing him to a knee. He tried to raise his remaining his blasters and fire but the stream of light cut off and an invisible fist smashed him onto his back, leaving him groaning. Look what you made me do, Django. A pair of golden eyes swam into his vision as he lay there, sprawled out on the deck. They looked almost sad, mournful. Why did you run? I didn't want it to come with this. Why do you think I've been holding back? He spun suddenly, sensing danger. Under Boba's fevered ministration slave I had finally managed to pivot in place. No further, mighty laser cannons tracked downward and took aim, yet never found their target. Naruto raised his right hand to form a cruel claw and they buckled with a horrid squeal of tortured steel. Boba still tried to fire and only succeeded in blasting the cannons apart. Had that been the end of it, had he simply stayed in the ship where Naruto couldn't get at him, young Boba Fett might have emerged from the ordeal unscathed. Alas, he made the mistake of confronting him. All the world slowed to a crawl as Slave Eyes hatch erized open and the boy stepped out, blaster in hand. Eyes wild, he charged. Get away from him, you. He cried, firing wildly as both men looked on, one in horror, the other in utter disbelief. You bastard. Get off my dad. Naruto slapped the first shot aside, ducked under the second, and made a fist against the third. With a startled yelp Boba flew forward from his feet and hung before them, suspended in the air like a puppet dangling on its strings. His soul saving grace was the blonde's mercy. He wasn't choking him, merely holding him aloft with his will. Is this your son? His voice suggested that mercy wouldn't last. Django's blood turned to ice in his veins. He's innocent. Leave him out of this. Oh. Those burning golden eyes narrowed upon him, rimmed now with a hint of furious red. Innocent, you say. He knew at once that it was the wrong thing to say, but it was too late to take the words back. My family was innocent, Django. Did that save them when they were taken? No. His head tilted, eyes ablaze. Where's the justice there? Spirits, he'd cracked, hadn't he? He was going to kill them. Both of them. And there wasn't a damn thing he could do about it now. Naruto had been pushed too far, too fast. If he hadn't fallen then he was dangerously close to doing so, danging on the very precipice of madness. And another thing. The whiskered warrior scowled, his lips peeling back to expose pearly white teeth. Where is he? Who? Sidious, you dolt. When he didn't respond the blonde roared at him. Palpatine, this has his bloody fingerprints all over it. Where is he hiding? Where did he take my family? He's dead. 
Django said as much, is here. A high, wild laugh burst out of the blonde as he flung himself into his face, is here. I thought so too, at first. After all, I killed him. But this now, there's been too many coincidences. Why kidnap me? Why bring me here, to this place? Why ambush me again after the fact? No. His smile shattered like brittle glass, replaced by a scowl. Someone's behind this, if not him then another. Someone has to be pulling the strings. Someone was. Not that he'd ever speak of them. I won't tell you anything. Oh, I think you will. His old student leaned away, favoring Boba with a melancholy look. You'll tell me everything. Or I'll take your son. Your family, as you took mine. No. Django tried to force himself upright but an iron boot crunched down on his chest. You can't. Lightning took him dead in the chest and he gasped, spine arching as it ended. Can. Um. Will. Talk and the both of you can walk away from this. The blonde offered, lowering his hand. Refuse, and well. He hefted his stolen saber, its ghastly crimson light casting Boba's face in cold relief. The boy whimpered, but the blonde didn't waver. I really don't want to do this, Django. Once again, that miserable smile graced those whiskered cheeks. I really don't. But we're out of time, I'm out of options and I am so very tired of this game. That Sif girl said as much. They're going to die, Django. Tell me where my family is. Now, Dad don't. Django surged upright and was struck down again. Monster, Craven. He ground out. You're not fit to rule Mandalore. Monster, am I? A golden brow rose in mild consternation. That's rich, coming from you. Perhaps you should speak more softly to me then, because I frankly don't give a fig what you, this world, or even the galaxy at large thinks of me. The boot ground deeper, cracking his ribs. So long as my fiends and family are safe I couldn't care less. Makes you a bit of a hypocrite, no. Still, I'm going to give you one last chance. Chance? What chance? He didn't flinch when Django spat in his face, didn't even deign to turn his face aside. I'd sooner die than act. With an explosive snap hiss, a second lightsaber ignited against his neck, bathing them in ethereal azure glow. The flinch that followed was barely telegraphed, scarcely noticeable at all unless one knew what to look for in their victim. Nevertheless, the warrior did notice and locked onto it with, with frightful intensity. His saber rose a fraction of an inch in response, searing their neck. A pained hiss greeted him. So that's how it is, huh? Blank eyes the color of poison honey gazed back at Django Fett, wholly devoid of any semblance of emotion. Defiance blazed high in his gaze once more, but the words that followed soon doused those flames. Stubborn to the end. Fine, I'm no fan of torture, but I have my ways. Now, then. Indeed, they prove themselves almost chilling by comparison. You can tell me where the hell you've stashed my family. Naruto leaned forward, lips peeled back in a scowl. Or your son can die screaming with them. We'll die. Django spat back. He'll kill us. Who? Naruto's retort was instant. I don't know their name. Django grit his teeth against the words, to no avail. No matter what choice he made here, he lost. If he held his tongue, Boba died. If he spoke, then his employer would kill him. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon. Either way his death was all but assured, or so he told himself. But only one option ended with Boba dead. He could tell all, or nothing at all. Yes, the choice was his. The bitter irony of it tore a laugh from him and Boba gasped at it. What choice did he have? None at all. If I tell you what I do know, Django ground the words out, you'll let us go. Just like that. Yes. Naruto leaned closer. You have my word. Django Fett sang like a canary. Luminara unduly considered herself a good Jedi. She was a paragon of virtue, a learned woman, the proud and as much as a Jedi could be proud master of one Barisafi. Her deeds were great, her accomplishments many. She prized herself as a champion of peace and justice throughout the galaxy, always willing to help those around her ever willing to go above and beyond the limits of her duty and service to the Force. Right now, it felt like the Force was laughing at her and her pato and both. Thanks for lending us the shuttle, Lumi. A hand came down on shoulder, jolting her out her reverie. I owe you one. Little more than a feather's bush, that touch, yet she knew he had the power to crush the bone there into powder. Such was the strength of the young man even now walking away from her. He didn't need his gauntlets to fight, nor that helmet to hide high face, but he chose to keep them anyway. She could respect that. What she did not respect was being a glorified taxi for the bloody Mandeller. Still, a debt was owed, and a debt must be repaid. Her eyes flicked after the whiskered warrior as he paced to the back of the ship where Dooku lay. The former master had taken his share of wounds in the battle, but he looked to be pulling through. Or he would, once Barris got him to sit still. She stole a glance to the cockpit, where them the endless tunnel of hyperspace still loomed. Umbara awaited, his captured family somewhere on that darkened world, and woe betide to any who stood in his way.
She blew out a quick breath, knowing what it was she was about to unleash. Naruto was not the sort to needlessly take life, but there could be no denying what he was planning to do. If left unchecked, his rampage might well destroy that planet itself. Best to have someone to keep him in check, in as much as one could these days. The things she did for old friends. A memory tickled her mind. Laughter and quiet talks in a dark alcove. The sharing of philosophies and views. Glasses clinking together as they shared a drink. Nothing more. Friends. All they were. All they would ever be. Rich laughter as he made one of his awful jokes. A pun so bad she couldn't help but scoff at. Friendship. An attachment. The force nudged her out of the past and back to the present. Still, it didn't stop her from cocking an ear as the weary blonde sat beside the aging count and gave him a once-over. How are we feeling, old man? Duku hissed only a little as Barris applied another back to patch. Never better. I'll be right as rain by the time we land. I'll hold you to that. A hand slapped his back. If you aren't, you're going in the back to tank. His piece said, he plodded back her way, leaving Duku to Barris's tender care. With luck, he'd slip into a healing trance. Or perhaps not. Duku had always been stubborn. Charismatic perhaps, but set in his way. More so now that he'd stepped away from the order. How close are we? Naruto's voice tugged at her. Not long now. She checked the console's readout, then tutted as he sank into the co-pilot's chair beside her. You are restless. Could you not have simply taken your friend's ship? You mean Django? She couldn't see his face behind that blasted Biscar helm but he sounded displeased. No, I've tormented him enough for one lifetime. He craned his neck toward the viewport, allowing the myriad lights of hyperspace to play off his polished helm. Once this mess with Umbara is over and my family's safe, he's free to take Boba and raise him as he sees fit. A resigned note entered his muffled voice. Let them hide away from the war that's coming. Better that way. For everyone. War. She blinked. But the talks with the separatists haven't yet broken down. After what you did on Genosis, his helmet inclined a fraction of an inch. They will. Any day now. You are certain of this. Never been more certain of anything in my life. His right hand shook on the console before he gripped it by the wrist. I've seen what's coming. Have you? Silence reigned between them. It's not the war that takes your life, but what comes after. He said it sadly, almost mournfully. That hasn't changed. Even now. For a moment, she could have sworn she heard him grind his teeth beneath his helmet. You die, and then your corpse is used as bait for other would-be Jedi. That was one of the futures I saw. Luminara couldn't quite fight down her flinch. She took a moment to master herself before speaking again. Some things cannot be changed, Naruto. Here at last he removed his helmet. They have. He shook his head as the cloying helm was torn free. They will be. I'll make sure of it. He did not look as she remembered him. He looked tired, worn, dark circles under his eyes, his golden eyes, and just like that, she understood. Dense in the force he may be, but he'd withdrawn himself from even her, refusing to let himself be detected. Her eyes flitted to the sabers resting at his belt. She'd only ever seen him carry two, but now there were two more dark and twisted things, exuding palpable malice. He had not possessed such the last time they'd met, and the sight did not hearten her. He'd ever been known for taking trophies, even in his current state. Yet those, trophies, he muttered, perhaps sensing her gaze. And a reminder, now it was the Jedi's turn to tilt her head. Of, not to fall any further. We all feel that pull from the dark side sometimes. Her voice was calm, even in her spirit wasn't. It's part of the Force, part of all of us. But it doesn't control you unless you let it. A pale green hand closed around his trembling fingers. The Force is a part of all living things, Naruto. That you feel tempted doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you human. Come to Coruscant with us once this is done. Let us help you. No. He shook her off. I'm not a Jedi. I refuse. Such a stubborn man. Dooku had been right about him. She reached out and patted his hand. Which is why I'll help you myself. I don't need help. There's a war coming, Luminara. And you have a family to find. She gave him a shove when he made to stand. Be calm. Rest. You'll help no one like this. You cannot be serious. Of course I'm serious. She shoved him again and he actually swayed a bit in his chair. When was the last time you rested? The silence proved telling. This is a rescue mission, not just for your family, but to recover missing Jedi at that. Somehow she doubted Master Kenobi would phrase it as such, but he'd still appreciate the assist. You need help. She leaned forward in her chair and carefully laid her hand over his. As a representative of the Jedi, I am offering my aid and that of my Padawan. You're not alone in this. Now close your eyes and rest or I'll knock you out. He quirked a blonde brow at her, mildly amused. You can try. She quirked a brow at him. No, I will succeed. Naruto met her gaze for what felt like an eternity. Luminara couldn't help but wonder what she would do if he refused to back down. 
The exhausted warrior before her was strong to concern Master Yoda himself. She really couldn't force him to do anything, but so long as he believed she would try, she had a weapon to use against him. Well, she pursed her lips into a thin line. Which will it be? Naruto tugged his helmet back on, the mask of Mandalore hiding his face away from the world once more. Nevertheless, he complied with her request. She felt his consciousness beginning to slip, dimming now as the true brunt of exhaustion exacted its toll. You'll wake me the second we exit hyperspace. She favored him with a wan smile. Certainly, my friend. With a sigh born of frustrations and exasperation, the wayward warrior tilted his head back in the chair. Gradually, his posture relaxed. His breathing evened out. He fell asleep in exactly nine seconds. Even so, she watched him for a handful more, just to make certain. It wouldn't do to have him wake again so soon after he'd nodded off. Master, after all, she had other matter to attend. Peace, Barris. Sensing her pupil's gaze, she held up a hand. Whatever you may think of him, he's not our enemy. But he's tainted. Her Padawan pointed out, hissing a little. Corrupted by the dark side. Was he? Emotional perhaps over his missing family. But he'd hardly become a Sith. Those monsters took what they wanted, when they wanted. They craved power, pride, prestige. A true Sith felt no guilt, no remorse for their actions. He did. It was difficult indeed to fake such things. Would she not feel anger if something happened to Barris? She wanted to say no, to trust in the Force, as she always had. Easier said than done. He is not a Jedi. Her gaze met hers. It is not our place to judge him. We will not tell the Council of this. Luminara thought she felt a flicker of approval from Dooku just then, even in his healing trance. Perhaps she imagined it. Barris pursed her lips, looking mulish. As you say, she would bear watching. Young, she still was. Naive. Was she not tainted too, then, for being a friend? The Jedi frowned upon such attachments. Isla had fallen to such. Friendship at first, then something more. So much more. She would not, or so she told herself. She was doing this for the sake of their friendship. Nothing more and nothing less. In that, she would not falter. She would stand firm no matter what came to pass. Luminara smiled softly and returned her attention to the exhausted blonde. Reaching out with the force, she tugged a blanket over him. Menace, indeed. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 6. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author Neon Zenjetsu on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.